Uh, and then I'm so excited to see the, the great attendance. Uh, as you all know, uh, we're sponsored by Cadence Translate this year. Cadence Translate uh, is a translation firm that specializes in the investment and consulting industry. So we're so proud uh, to have Matt Conford, who's the CEO of Cadence Translate, here with us today to present our keynote speech um, for, for, for the competition. Uh, Matt is a Warren 06 alum, um, and he started Cadence Translate. Uh, to provide the language services uh, uh, between uh, the U.S. and in particular China and other countries as well. Uh, I'm so excited to have you back with us today. Well, thank you. All right, so hopefully the photo that you see up here gives you a sense of the tone of the presentation I hope to set today. Um, and now, one of the things I believe is 5525. So what does this mean? It means that to justify my time in front of you, I have five seconds to earn your respect for five minutes, and then I have five minutes to earn your respect for 25 minutes. So how do I earn your respect in five seconds? Well, the short answer is that we pay for this event. <laughs> <laughs> so you might have been seeing this, this newsletter throughout the year and wondered who the heck is this cadence company. Uh, that's here what we're telling you to talk about today, but you're at least stuck with me for the next five minutes. So let's see what we can get through in five minutes. Uh, believe it or not, that's me. Hard to recognize, which shows you what entrepreneurship does to you after 14 years. <laughs> uh, so anyway, a little bit about me. Uh, as you heard, I graduated from here in 2006. That was the year that Huntsman first opened. That was the year that Patra first opened, uh, which for you guys, you know, this is probably just standard stuff, but for me, it was like, wow, this is awesome. Um, other things, so I lived in Asia for five years, primarily in Beijing. I uh, traveled all around Asia, obviously, once you're over there. I started this company, Cadence Translate. We provide services to the hedge fund, private equity, VC, consulting industry, primarily by giving them language services in a way that they've never had access to before. Uh, this year, we're on track to support about 10,000 due diligence projects around the world. Most of those are due diligence beginning in a Western country and going into Asia, but there are some other ones too, Chinese into Korean, Japanese into Indonesia, et cetera. Uh, what else? Um, I, I have employed 10, 10 people over the course of Cadence, but I haven't seen them here. There's a few of them still lurking around campus. Uh, but we always take in Penn interns every summer, and we're certainly looking to bring in more Penn full-time folks in our two offices in Los Angeles and Beijing. Uh, the majority of my investors are Wharton alumni as well. Right? As much as they talk about, oh, you just network, brand, et cetera, you know, I am living proof of that. When the company was started, I said, okay, well, I wasn't a particularly good networker as an undergrad. I always got nervous at those damn coffee chat things. Um, but just the value of the Wharton name made it such that I was able to just cold message a lot of Wharton alumni and get them in as investors. And then finally, I do teach international due diligence at a few universities, not yet at Penn. Uh, but it's certainly something that as I'm transitioning from having started a company to really espousing the vision of where I see the industry going, universities are great for that. Um, so, hopefully I've earned your, your respect for the rest of the time. I know we're a little behind schedule, so I'll move a little bit quicker. Uh, I'm really only here to talk about two things. The story that I've had, particularly in regards to Asia, because I think it might either uh, inspire or intimidate folks, as well as just leave a few bits of advice based on the time that I've had so far. Um, okay, so again, look at me, very healthy. Start, started uh, traveling to China about eight years ago. Uh, this is, uh, what is this, South Beauty, a restaurant chain in China that's quite delicious. Um, but I'm certainly not one of, I'm not like you guys. When I was an undergrad, I had very little interest in moving to Asia, right? So when I was here, I was like, well, I just want to get a job at McKinsey or Goldman or Morgan Stanley, like everyone here. And, and I was fortunate enough to get a job at Bain, but I still wasn't interested in Asia. What happened to me was that I was really interested in the energy industry. So I got to Bain in 2006. Uh, I don't know if you guys remember, but the price of oil hit $145 a barrel in 2008. So I said, ah, this is the industry that I like, the like energy industry. It's good, hard assets. It's super interesting. You know, climate change is real, so I'm going to be able to make money and save the world if I go into the energy industry. Uh, so. A few years after that, I was able to land a job at a clean tech private equity firm, still in the US. And a few years after that, they eventually said, we're gonna open up a Beijing office. And they needed to get both funding from, from Asian investors. They wanted to deploy capital in China. And I was just the Caucasian in the office who was like, hey, Asia's pretty cool. Like, can, can you send me over there? And they were like, how's your Mandarin? And I was like, terrible. 
and they're like, all right, so you're not, you're not allowed to go. But then <laughs> someone who was slated to go to the firm. So they were like, uh-oh, we need to send someone from our New York office over there. Wasn't there some kid that raised his hand and his Mandarin sucks? Let's just send him over there anyway. So that was me. Um, so I got a really, really cool job doing private equity in Beijing. I had the private equity name, the private equity salary, the private equity mandate. And then something happens. What is that something? They shut down the office. Um, for those who kind of remember the clean tech investments around 2010, 2011, all the investment sectors that we were focused on went belly up, primarily solar as well as some wind as well. So I had this cool private equity job for like a month. This is me in Xinjiang. I was able to go to Xinjiang and I had like two security guards, which was awesome. <laughs> Um, but that quickly evaporated and I found myself <laughs> in Beijing with no, no job, uh, you know, terrible Chinese. And so I did what one does when they're in at least China and they don't have a job, so I taught English. <laughs> <laughs> so for those who spend time in Beijing, you know why that's particularly funny. I will say I had an awesome teaching English gig, which was at PetroChina, which is China's biggest oil company. So my students, were like mid-level executives at China's biggest oil company. I'll never forget one of the assignments I gave them was, okay, everyone, stand up and give a two-minute talk on where you'd like to go on vacation, anywhere in the world, it doesn't matter. So like all these Beijing-based oil executives, and they get up and in English, they start talking about, they want to go to Sudan, they want to go to Kazakhstan. Go to Australia, somewhere. <laughs> They love the oil industry so much, and like these are all the places they were about <laughs> it's where they want to go. Maybe they were worried that like if they said something other than an oil place, I would tell on their boss. I'd be like a narc who's like, oh yeah, John doesn't want to go explore oil. He wants to go on holiday. So it was very weird, but I, I absolutely loved the experience teaching English in China. And I seriously recommend it you know, just for a little bit for anyone from here. At some point though, that doesn't sustain itself. So I decided, all right, let me level up my Chinese skills. Uh, I was able to get a scholarship from a program called the Lakemore Foundation, which if no one's heard of, I highly recommend. One year, all expenses paid tuition for one of the most intense language learning programs in China. Um, I got the scholarship, but I turned it down because A, I was just so frustrated with learning Chinese. I just thought, okay, no matter how advanced I get, I'm always gonna be left behind. And at the same time, I stumbled upon what I thought was the translation industry, but it's actually the interpretation industry. So there is a pretty distinct difference between translation and interpretation. Does anyone know the difference here? I could venture a guess. Is it interpretation when it's like verbal and then translation? And translation? Exactly. That's, that's like also like the most succinct explanation. Exactly. So I have found that what I thought was a kind of boring industry, translation, that there is this cousin interpretation for face-to-face -face meetings or phone calls that was completely busted. And there was a huge opportunity for an entrepreneur to really own that market. So I said, okay, hey, I worked in consulting, I worked in private equity, we wouldn't pay anything to have someone who knew how LBOs work and they knew the solar industry and we could just hire them for a couple hours here and there. Right, so I was like, all right, there's definitely something on the demand side for this. And at the same time, on the supply side, I would meet all these interpreters throughout China who didn't know anything about how to market themselves to financial services and consulting firms. So the first iteration of the business was called Seek Panda. That's why you saw Panda on the first slide of my presentation. And it was very cute, right? This is what a profile would look like. This is Daniel. We would have a few bullets on him. We'd highlight where his industry was. Super cute. And it was a name that everyone remembers, Seek Panda. Um, and from a business model perspective, it was a self-service marketplace. You register, you put your price up there, clients come online, and they browse from whoever they want to hire. And it's sim simple enough to understand. Um, at the same time, then I started reaching out to Wharton alums and said, hey, I'm this American in Beijing. Do you guys want to throw money at this company? And we were successful. Um, so we ended up raising $300,000, mostly from Wharton alums in Asia. And at the same time, I'd be surprised if any of you guys know this, but in Beijing, there's something called the Penn Wharton China Center. Has anyone been there? Okay, a few people. All right, good. Most people didn't know it exists. Um, they were kind enough to give us office space that first year. So we had free office space in the Penn Wharton China Center. There was a ton of funny stories about that, but I won't get into them. Um, but you can imagine, as I was getting this money and this interest from Wharton, 
they were like, well, why are you C Panda? Like, that's, that's a little too cute, you know? Am I really going to go to the MD of my hedge fund and say, hey, let's hire this C Panda firm for due diligence? <laughs> um, so we eventually said, all right, let's just become an enterprise company, right? Let's focus on asset management and consulting clients. And let's give ourselves an enterprise name. So we went with Cadence Translate. Um, why this photo is here? We actually live streamed our name change. So like literally the day that we were like changing the website to point from this domain to that domain, the day that we were like sending out all the emails, for whatever reason, we were like, let's just live stream this and see if anyone gives a crap. And uh, we have like 500 people tune in, which in China is nothing. But for me, I was like, why do, you know, one of them is my mom. The other one, <laughs> I don't know why they were watching. Uh, but nonetheless, right, Cadence Translate was the future of the company. Um, there, the woman in the upper left there, she was a pen intern with us. I think she's already graduated, but the first of many pen interns that we had. So life was pretty good as Cadence Translate. Right? You can see lower left there, um, that's another pen intern we had. He was interning with us and he was at a recruiting event for Cadence. We did a team trip. You guys, everyone should know at least what Skyline that is, right? Shanghai, Shanghai, yeah. So even though we were all in Beijing, we took a trip down to Shanghai. We went to uh, Shanghai Disney World. It was like super fun. Things seemed to be going quite well for Cadence. Um, fast forward about another year, we got into 500 startups, which anyone who's kind of thinking about the VC world, they're like, in California, and it seems like you get a feather in the cap of Cadence that we're at this accelerator. I, right? I got to do demo day, you know, it seemed like, okay, this is cool. But then that was when everything really fell apart, to be honest. And any entrepreneur that comes and talks to you guys and says they've never had like, you know, low light or never had mental health issues is lying. And for me, this was that period. So what, what went wrong? <laughs> it's more like, you know, what, what went right? That's harder to, to define. Um, so first of all, major co-founder drama, right? In almost any entrepreneur is going to be faced with either the loneliness of being a solo founder or the drama of having co-founders. And for me, the drama of having co-founders came to a head in 2017. Right, the equivalent of a entrepreneur divorce. At the same time, we were getting a lot of pressure from 500 startups to say, well, why are you a services company? Just create an API to like automate all of this. And I was like, well, yes, but you know, hedge funds aren't going to sign up for an API to like plug into their due diligence deal room. It just it doesn't make sense. They were just they were putting an awkward amount of pressure on it. Um, and then the hardest thing about that particular period of time was we actually ended up having to let go of most of the team. And it wasn't because they were underperforming, it was because they were just the wrong people for the future of Cadence. Whether it was the future that I wanted, whether it was the future that our investors wanted. You know, I hate to say it, but it just became clear that I had hired people to get us from you know, here to here, but they weren't the same people that get us from here to here. Uh, just to compound things for the awkwardness, we were all living in one house. So it was super awkward to be like, Hey, you're fired, but I'll see you at dinner tonight, you know, in the backyard. <laughs> um, so, you know, we joke about it. It's been a couple of years. I've helped everyone get jobs. I'm still in, in good contact and relationships with them, but an absolutely brutal time in my life as an entrepreneur. Um, so, I kind of went back to China, tail between my legs, and said, All right, I have to rebuild this company function by function. The folks who were at Cadence, they were good, but we needed to get more professionals. So, this is a photo of me. <laughs> Womp womp, all by myself at a career fair because there was like literally no one else at the company that I could like drag with me to the to a career fair. Uh, but it worked, right? I had a renewed sense of purpose, a renewed definition of who I wanted to hire, and you can see, you know, not too long thereafter, we were able to get more folks into the company. We learned to say no to opportunities. Here's an example of a request we got from the Italian Home for Children. They work at a mental health services agency, and they need an interpreter. So I kind of felt like an asshole for turning that down, right? That's, that's good, you know, good mojo that I would be building, good karma I'd be introducing into the world, but it's so far afield from what we were trying to do, we just had to say no quite often. At the same time, we were investing in our employees, and so we were really saying, hey, how do you want to get ahead in this world? So we really focused on their professional development, gave them a lot of cool learning opportunities, and this is the result. Right, this shows monthly revenue, and uh, the colors represent sort of who brought in that revenue, and you can just see the kind of tremendous growth we had once we started becoming more focused on what we were aiming to do. 
Uh, so now that the company was stabilized, I moved to Los Angeles uh, about a year ago. I started work on a new project. My unborn son, uh, who you'll be uh, meeting slightly, I'll tell you about that in a second. Uh, he's due in February, but we're thrilled to be starting a family here in America. Um, at the same time, we want Cadence to continue to be the world's best company when it comes to international due diligence. So that's the kind of narrative I've had in Cadence. With the last few minutes, I do just want to impart a few kind of nuggets of wisdom, and I was really trying not to have it be the like graduation speech generic stuff, but like remember all the anxieties I had when I was a Penn undergrad and trying to say, you know, if I could talk to myself back then, what would I want to know? So I'm just going to go over a few of those, then we'll turn it over to the stock pitch. So in terms of my advice, uh, well, the first thing I want to point out is I don't want everyone to think of this as a China-only discussion, right? This is Asia at night, and you can just see it is far more than just one country. I really hope people here are interested in kind of the broad, Asia in the broad sense of the world and not just uh, East Asia, i.e. China. So I'm going to call this section, I wish that I knew what I know now. And, you know, if I were in your shoes, I would be like, well, crap, I don't have, I've never gotten a job in Asia. You know, I, I'm never going to be able to, so I have to get myself over to Asia. And I disagree with that sentiment. Particularly in the era that we are in now, there are a lot of ways to get legitimate, if not um, kind of unique, perspective on Asia. So here are a couple things that I don't think teach you guys these, these different things in Wharton. Does anyone know what drop shipping is? Drop ship, what's drop shipping? It's like when you have um, a business and you don't feel like it's an email man, so when somebody clicks on the website, um, they actually get the buyer you want to proceed with that and then ship it directly to the Exactly, exactly. So you could, in effect, contract out production to a factory in Asia, set up a website that is just taking in marketing, that is just a marketing website, take in orders, and then you're just the middleman. Exactly. So dropshipping is awesome. Um, import, export, die goal. You know, no die goal. Come on, someone here must know. You know, die goal. Um, it's kind of like, I mean, I come from Sydney, Australia, and so what they do is they buy all the uh, yield powder and then they put it back in China. <laughs> Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> so it's, it's kind of a variation on drop shipping. Like in both cases, you're taking orders. In drop shipping, you don't take inventory on. You're just a middleman in die call. You literally take on inventory and you're like, kind of, it's a little shady of a business, not going to lie. But you basically bring it uh, into a country. So I mean, if I'm looking at a resume and I see someone that has that type of experience, that is freaking legit, right? If you're able to work in either of these sectors. So I, I give a lot of respect to those. Uh, you guys must obviously you know live streaming and joke wall, right? But to the extent that you want to be one of these folks that is like a professional shopper here in America, broadcasting to an audience back in Asia, that is also extremely relevant expertise. That even if you try and fail, you'll still get a lot of credibility with any future employer. Uh, my wife remembers when I tried to be a Chinese streamer or the Twitch of China. I was like, I'm gonna be a white guy speaking Chinese, playing video games and get an audience of thousands. And I failed miserably, but whatever, I tried, right? Um, I also have a funny streamer name, which if there's time to be I can share before that. Um, and then finally, then there's a company, Red Pulse. Has anyone heard of Red Pulse? This is a Wharton founded company, a really cool company. It's basically seeking alpha, but for China. So you, as individual contributors, basically everyone doing the stock pitch in five minutes, you can write an article about why a certain stock is over or undervalued, and you can get upvoted, you can monetize it, so every time someone asks you a question, you get like a dollar. Um, the point is, this is a Wharton entrepreneur who built a business that you guys can participate in and get major credibility from right here in Philadelphia. Okay, a few other things. Um, as I mentioned, I think people tend to think of, quote, Asia as China. And, oh, if I'm going to try to get a job, I have to go to China. I would disagree with that sentiment, even though it's a little hypocritical, because that was where I landed when I went over to there. But the way I think about it, at least as an entrepreneur, is, OK, sure, your biggest addressable market might be in China. And that's going to be the market that gets you from $10 million a year to $100 million. But it's really freaking hard to get to $10 million a year. So pay attention to countries that are kind of highly ranked in the so-called doing business in. Because once you're in those countries, you can get to your first $10 million of revenue. Right? So look at business-friendly countries like Singapore. It is much easier to set up a business there 
get your first hundred customers or thousand customers and then expand into China instead of starting straight there. So even if you guys want your career to be anchored in China, I would say consider other places first. Okay, and then finally, um, OCR friggin' sucks. I hated OCR. <laughs> it was so stressful. People start wearing suits in class and like you don't have any interviews yet and you're like, oh my God, what's wrong with me? You know, that same anxiety from my era, I'm sure exists now. And one of my kind of fondest memories is I was walking by one of these poles that you have here on campus with all the flyers. It was 2004 and there was a super crappy sign that said, come work at Facebook. Right? And I was like, Facebook, that's a fun website, but like, you know, I would never want to work there. This is 2005, right? Facebook had just launched. You know, I was like, it's all about New York. It's all about banking. And don't even consider that. And clearly the world changes quickly. And so if I were to distill kind of my advice for that, it's like, there's always going to be prestigious employers, right? No doubt. And sure, those are always going to be good on your resume. But if you want to take a risk, look at the ambition of the companies that you're going to, right? Some companies, you know, they all say they want to make the world a better place, blah, blah, blah. But there are some that are like legitimately more ambitious than others. And if I just had that filter when I was going through recruiting as an undergrad, you know, I probably wouldn't have started Cadence. I might have landed elsewhere and I'm glad that didn't happen. But I wish I would at least taken more seriously those opportunities. Um, oh, right, I'm sorry. And so as an example, here's another Wharton company, Park Lu. I'm guessing no one's heard of them. They are a marketplace for influencers. So let's say you're a brand and you're like, oh, I, we need to get our name out on Instagram. How much do we need to pay this influencer? They are a marketplace for that. So pretty cool company. That's it. Uh, thank you everyone for the time. So my two calls to action, uh, we are hiring in LA and in Beijing for both full-time jobs and freelance jobs. Anyone who's either bilingual or wants access to pre-investment research, we have some awesome jobs and we set up a landing page just for Wharton uh, students. And then please be in touch. Uh, so you have all my kind of key contact info. Uh, very much thank you for the time. And I do want to shout out, my wife is going to be the judge of the next uh, stock pitch. So she was actually a Wharton undergrad at the same time as me. So we were on campus together. We didn't know each other. Didn't even know each other existed, same year. Uh, we met in Beijing in 2013, 2014? <laughs> 13, 2013. 2013, thank you. Um, so, I love you too. Even if you find work to be a kind of, um, you know, it's four years of your life, it really does stick with you forever. I'm so fortunate to have met my wife through the Warden Network, and uh, you're going to hear from her in the next presentation. So thank you, everyone. <laughs>